Hello, welcome to the Friday, August 24, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Stockheim, Germany. Sometimes fishing really doesn't take a lot of work or resources and Xavier came across a number of phishing scams actually that took advantage of formcrafts.com. Formcrafts.com is not a malicious site. It allows you to set up simple forms that users submit and then it collects the data from it. And they even have a simple plan for small forms with a few submissions. And this is exactly what fishers take advantage of. So they cannot change the domain name here. They have to use formcrafts.com. But then of course, the page name, they can try and find one that looks good to the victim. And Xavier was poking a little bit around there and for example, found pages like web IT, IT help desk, IT support, which served up login forms, collecting users' credentials and other information in some cases. I mentioned before that not all VPN applications are created equal. Some of them just don't work, others do not encrypt your traffic. And then there's always the risk that the endpoint of the VPN connection could intercept and could inspect any traffic that you're passing through this VPN. A special mention here deserves Onavo. Onavo is a product that Facebook purchased a few years back and it was often advertised as Facebook Protect. Now, on first sight, it's, well, yet another one of these VPN applications. And of course, Facebook is in charge of the endpoints. But the risk here is not just that Facebook is able to inspect all traffic that you're sending via the VPN, even if it's not going to Facebook itself. In addition, it will send a number of other data items to Facebook, like for example, Wi-Fi data usage. Also, if you don't have the application turned on, so you are running the application, but you're not actually using the VPN, it will still report back any sites you're visiting back to Facebook for marketing purposes. Now, this was originally sort of discovered in March and I'll link uh, to the blog post from back then. But just now, Apple put some pressure on Facebook and finally had this application removed from Apple's App Store. And usually I try to stay away from politics, but the next event, uh, really I've seen this play out a lot in other organizations as well. You may have heard that the Democratic National Committee believed that it was attacked via a targeted phishing attack, which later turned out to be only a well done phishing test. What this really usually comes down to is whether or not your employees know how to report a suspect phishing email and how these suspect phishing emails are then escalated if they appear to be something more severe. Phishing tests should certainly be coordinated with the security department. So if a user does recognize the phishing attempt, which is one of the things that you hope will actually happen when you're doing a phishing test like this, that whoever receives the report and receives a copy of this suspected phishing attack knows that it is a test and knows how to then properly report it to whoever is conducting this test. And Kaspersky Lab is reporting that it found an interesting cryptocurrency trading application that was written for Windows and Mac OS with the little twist that the built-in updater for the application is used to download malicious components. Kaspersky calls this application Apple Juice and the updater doesn't just blindly download the malicious code. Instead, it first profiles the system, uploads a system profile to a command control server, and then only specific systems are being infected with the malicious part. This is likely done to prevent discovery of this malicious component. So only a few users receive it. And of course, it could also check whether or not anti-malware is installed 
installed that would discover this malicious component. The Trojan that was installed when Kaspersky looked at this application was Fall Chill, which is commonly associated with the Lazarus group. And earlier this week I mentioned that Debian Linux had some issues with recent Intel microcode patches, which included a more complex license that Debian found to be incompatible with its Linux distribution. Now the part that really caught the most flag in this license was that Intel specifically forbade publishing any benchmark results with the patch applied. You may remember from prior patches there were a lot of discussions about the performance hit that any of the patches cost so Intel basically just wanted to say hey don't talk about any performance hits that are caused by this patch. Well uh, today Intel revised it li its license, simplified it and specifically no longer objects to publishing benchmark results. Haven't heard from Debian yet to see if they now are happy with this new version. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.